yesterday of selectivity. And then we define this here to be a little bit more specific. This is the instantaneous selectivity we looked at last night. And we call that capital S D over U. So we have instantaneous selectivity of the desired compound with respect to the undesired compound. We define that SDU as the rate of formation of the, of the rate of formation of the undesired component. The rate of desired or the rate of undesired. We're going to introduce another selectivity in this evening's class where we look at what we call the overall selectivity. The instantaneous selectivity is called that because it depends on the reaction rate. So we know that for plug flow reactors and for batch reactors, that that reaction rate is never constant. That reaction rate is changing depending on where you are along the plug flow reactor. And in a batch reactor, depending on the time, these numerator and denominator terms are changing. We're going to see that in the simulation in CPS class. CSTRs have constant rates. And so this rate in the numerator and this rate in the denominator is always, is always fixed in the CSTR. So last night we considered the case where if I've got this reaction with A going to a desired product and an undesired product with rate constant KD and KU, we said that the rate of formation of D is rate constant KD CA to the alpha 1 rate of formation of the undesired is KUCA to the alpha 2. And we said yesterday, if alpha 1 exceeds alpha 2, so the power or the order of that rate of that uh, reaction for the desired component exceeds the undesired component, there's several ways we can maximize the selectivity. So to maximize selectivity SD over U. We said we can choose to use a PFR or a batch. And we said that that comes down to the fact that we want to maximize the concentration. We can use a PFR or a batch or avoid using inerts or diluents. Same word, just depending on the gas or the other system. So the reason why we want to maximize the selectivity SDU is because in this case it's equal to KD over KU CA to the alpha 1 minus alpha 2. So if we can maximize that concentration CA, we'll be maximizing the selectivity SDU. 
Now, a few people can ask me why would you not use a CSTR? So maybe we can add this as another point. Don't use a CSTR. So if we consider a CSTR's operation, we've got my feed coming into the reactor and then leaving the reactor is CA. The entire contents of the reactor operates at that concentration CA. But for a PFR, for example, we have my feed coming in and leaving I have concentration CA. But at least initially, that concentration is high and then drop more. So at least for this initial portion of the reactor, the concentration is high. The CSTR the material comes in and everything drops to a slow concentration in a well-mixed assumption. So we have just simply low CA throughout the reactor. A PFR reactor will have at least high CA initially and dropping off to lower concentration at the end. Same idea for a batch. For a batch process, if I have to plot CA against time, same idea. We start with high concentration and drops off. So for both batch systems and for PFR systems, we will at least experience high concentrations initially and then dropping off to lower concentrations. With CSTR, low concentrations at steady state throughout the, throughout the reactor. If we flip the case around, so if alpha 1 is smaller than alpha 2, which may happen in some instances, Yep, go ahead. Uh, for the CSTR, you're saying that the CA will be the same throughout, right? The concentration CA, yes. Yeah. Well, can't you control the CA concentration for the CSTR? No, CA is a result of the volume of the reactor. So it's simply an output of the system and the input of the system. And the temperature I choose to operate. Yeah, that's a function of the operating conditions. But once those are set, CA is set. So if alpha 2 exceeds alpha 1, some of the things you can do then to maximize, well, let's put it this way. If alpha 2 is greater than alpha 1, and SDU is maximized if CA is small. So in this particular case where the power of CA in the undesired reaction is greater than the desired reaction, we will maximize SDU if CA is, a, is lowered. Okay, so I'm then raising a small number there. And what can I do in those instances? What type of reaction would you select in, in that? The opposite. So the maximum of CA is small. Use a CSTR. What other things could I do? Use a Hertz. And there's one other interesting idea is to use recycle. So if we look at that, let's say we've said we're using a CSTR, so we've chosen our reactor already. Here's my feed into the reactor. Leaving are my products. So that would be CA, my desired, and my undesired. CA, CD, and CU would be leaving that CSTR. Because in this Unit, I've got A going to E, and I've got A going to U. So I've got all three components leaving. One way to create a dilution effect is actually to recycle. So by recycling my products around, I will create a dilution effect, essentially, encouraging lower concentrations of CA. We know from our second year course that Recycle is something we do so that we get greater consumption of our raw material. A is my raw material. Recycling it around gives a greater opportunity 
to react, or the second go, the third, fourth go to react. And by doing a recycle, or by adding a recycle stream, we're creating this dilution. Effect. So that's an interesting um, change to our reaction system that we can do in this particular case. Yesterday, uh, what someone also mentioned to modify the temperature in the system. Let's just quickly discuss that, the effect of temperature. So we look at changing our reactor, or picking up an, an appropriate reactor, I should say. But one other option is to say, let's modify the temperature and see what the effect is. So consider the case where alpha 1 is equal to alpha 2. So let's take away the fact that our, our uh, relative powers have an input. So we just simply look at the case where I've got only the effect of the rate constants. Then SD over U is equal to KD over KU. So the concentration effect goes away because of cancellation. Now we know that KD is equal to the activation energy E to the ED over R of T. And we have a similar, similar function for the undesired component. So in that case, I could write that ratio out as the pre-exponential factor for the desired over the undesired multiplied by E raised to the minus activation energy for the desired minus undesired over RT. Subbing in the expression we know for the activation energies and simplifying a little bit, we get that form shown up there. What this leads to is I could plot temperature. So temperature here on the x-axis against selectivity on the y-axis, and we can see how selectivity varies with temperature. And what will happen is we'll get something along that line where the selectivity goes up for the desired reaction against the undesired reaction for the case where your orange ED exceeds ED. And for the situation where ED, the activation energy for the, un for the desired reaction is smaller than the undesired reaction against the low case. <coughs> smaller than an undesired reaction, it tells us to operate our reactor at lower temperatures to favor that desired reaction. Okay, so in the course project, one of the options that you select is to choose the operating temperature along the reactor, you're going to find that by adjusting the temperature, you're going to, to have um, greater or smaller selectivity. So operate our reactor at lower temperature, but there's obviously one caveat here, but not so low as to, as to get almost no reaction occurring. lowering the temperature, your reaction rate will drop <coughs> off and you'll need larger and larger reactors. So it's essentially you're balancing capital costs against operating costs here. 
and economics. Your economics, you're going to improve because you're going to get greater selectivity for your desired product, but it's going to be at the expense of a greater capital cost. So there is a bit of a trade-off for trade -off all of these, but there's going to be some guidance on how to play with those. Now in. So we're going to take A and B and we're going to consider these re multiple reactions. And the, the reason for using this example is it's also going to introduce some interesting configurations for the reactor that we can use. So consider, uh, let's call this side reactions. So in this instance I've got A plus B going to my desired, but there's also an undesired reaction that occurs. So we'll call these rates KB, CA to the alpha 1, CB to the beta 1, and the undesired rate is KU, CA to the alpha 2, CB to the beta 2. And if I sub those two rates into the selectivity expression SD of U, I would get KD of KU, CA to the alpha 1 minus alpha 2, CB to the beta 1 minus beta 2. Obviously, four combinations one could look at. You could look at alpha 1 exceeding alpha 2, beta 1 being greater than beta 2, and all, all the other combinations. But we'll just look at, at two interesting combinations, or well, just really one actually that will help us put this in perspective. So if alpha 1 is greater than alpha 2, and beta 1 is smaller than beta 2, So I'll look at this combination. The combination where these signs are just flipped, um, you just do the opposite. So, so we don't really need to consider all four combinations. The textbook really goes into detail on all four combinations. So there is that as a fallback, if you'd like to consider all the others. What this means is if alpha 1 is greater than alpha 2, this is telling me to maximize CA. And this is telling me to minimize CB. If I can do both of those simultaneously, I'm going to bump that selectivity number right up. So I'd like to do both of those simultaneously. What we're going to consider here are reactive configurations that will achieve this for us. And the first one that's actually quite interesting to consider is the batch reactor. So <coughs> The semi batch reactor. And that's why I'm considering this topic, is because we're introducing this new type of reactor called the semi batch reactor. Well, it's not a new type of reactor, it is just a batch reactor, but we operate it in a, in a way we've not yet looked at in this course before. <coughs> the semi batch reactor says take my reactor and fill it with only A. Initially, I charge the reactor only with species A. <coughs> the, that's, that's the regular batch mode of operation. We would then normally turn the batch on and the, and the reaction occurs. Well, species B, we want to minimize species B. So what we do is we add species B into the reactor slowly. While the batch progresses. So these added at a slow rate, 
this keeps the concentration of B down. The concentration of A <coughs> is high initially and starts to react with B as it's added. So this configuration achieves both those goals for us. The second batch refers to the fact that we don't just add our material and turn the reactor on. We're turning our reactor on, but then adding inputs to the reactor. So actually what happens here is my volume will change with time. So when I charge my reactor with A, I need to leave some space for the amount of B to be added. Also, that assumption of constant volume now goes away that we've used up to this point. So, so we, when we do the modeling and write up the expressions for that, we cannot take V out of the integral anymore for same batch reactors. Another way we might achieve the same goal of keeping A high and B low in a plug flow reactor is as follows. You've seen a little bit of this before. Is use side streams on the PFR. So in my plug flow reactor, up to now we've just added my species at the entry point A. But if I'm saying use side streams, I'm saying take B and add it <coughs> at periodic injection points along the reactor. So a bit more capital cost here to achieve this. But A is essentially at high concentration initially and B then is added in at periodic points. So it keeps the overall concentration of B low and the overall concentration of A high. My products come down to the X. And we've also learned a few classes ago that a plug flow reactor can be approximated by a whole lot of CSTRs in sequence. One CSTR followed by another CSTR followed by another CSTR. So one interesting way we can get a similar approach to this side streams on a PFR is to use what are called CSTRs in series. Would be another alternative. And here you configure it in a similar way. So here's my first CSTR where I add A. That output of the CSTR goes to the next one. And that output goes to the third CSTR. I'll just draw three here. And then species B is added up here. It's added in a different color. So species B then added to that reactor, added to that reactor added to that reactor. And then leaving the final CSTR added by products. <coughs> okay, so the more CSTRs I have in series, the, the closer and closer this configuration here on the right approximates, approximates the configuration on the left. But both are essentially equivalent. All three of these configurations I considered are trying to achieve this objective of keeping A's concentration high and B's concentration low. Okay, now if I flip the signs here on the alpha, so alpha 1 is smaller than alpha 2, beta 1 is greater than beta 2, I do exactly the same, I just interchange the role of A and B. So three have particular options. Apply to a slightly different uh, situation. We've considered these examples up to now, or these discussions up to now, being reactions in parallel. Let's consider a reaction in series and look at it as an example. So I'll introduce the theory and as an example. So reactions in series. We call that means we've got A going to B, which is then going to C. We've got reaction K1, we've got reaction K2, or rate constant K1 and K2, I should say. Let's uh, 
Note that these are elementary reactions. With K1 equal to 0.5 hours and K2 is equal to 0.2 hours to the minus 1. So elementary reactions, these are first order because the stoichiometric coefficients are 1 in each case. And I'm going to consider the case where B is desired and C is my undesired. And we're going to do this modeling in a batch reactor. In the tutorial and for the next assignment, you will do the modeling in a CSTR. <coughs> but we're going to consider it as a batch reactor. So for that, I'm implying I fill my reactor with A only. And then A decomposes into B, which then decomposes into C. We would like to maximize B and minimize the undesired amount of C before. Okay, so let me put here this is a batch reactor. <coughs> and my aim here is if I want to maximize B, is to find how long do I need to run that batch to get a maximum amount of B forming. If I run the batch for a short period of time, I'm not going to get much of B forming. If I run it for a really long time, what's going to end up happening? It's all going to decompose over into C. So there's some point in, in the middle there that we're going to be optimal. So how long to maximize CB? So my objective here is how long, let me say, to run the batch. How long to run the batch to maximize CD? So here's the approach we follow for these problems. So if we're slightly modifying our, our approach. I will introduce it by example. So the step we follow is to, step one is write out the design equation. Okay, that's, that's been our regular approach up to now, to write out the design equation. But the key here is write out the design equation for every species. So this is the, the new the new part is to do this for every species. And the second step is we've normally written out the design equation first and then we filled in the rate expression. So that's no different to before. Now, what we do here now is for every reaction. So this is new. 
So in the past, we wrote out our design ex equation and we expressed it in terms of conversion. Conversion works great when we've only got a single reaction system and a single basis code. In the past, we filled in our rate expression. So we filled in, say, minus RA is KCA to the 2. Well, now this time we're going to have to do that for every reaction that's occurring. We now have multiple reactions. So let's follow that approach. And in this example, that would require us then to write out the design equation for a batch reactor is TNA by T is equal to RAV. So we've seen that from before. So let me do this then for every species. I can modify this as DCA dt is equal to RA. And in this case, RA is equal to minus K1CA. So we're told it's an elementary reaction and that would be the appropriate rate of <coughs> Easy to integrate. CA is equal to CA naught e to the minus K1T. So it's a batch reactor. I can quite quickly write what CA is as a function of time. We've, we've seen this one over and over before, first order system. So right now what I've done up here is I've written out the design equation for every species, I've only done for species A. Let's take a look at species B. So for species B, that would be DCB by DT is equal to RB. RB, remember, is the rate of formation of B. What would that be in this case, given that expression over there on the left-hand side? is quite clear because there's a big negative sign. The CB is always positive, the CB is positive. The fact that there's a minus in here is telling me this is going away. So this is the depletion of B. What's the formation of B is plus K1 CB. So the rate expression for B is, is a little bit more messy, more complex than we've seen before. So both forming B, so this, this part over here is telling me how am I forming B. And this part over here is the depletion. <laughs> Good catch. So it's K1CA. We're forming a proportional to CA. So A goes to B. Can we integrate this guy? And so DCB on the left, there's a CB over here on the right. I can bring the CB over here. There's a CA on the right hand side. I know what CA is as a function of time. We can do this it's called the integrating factor. Remember that awful thing? I don't really care whether you can do this or not. I know previous courses, they insist that you're able to use the integrating factor. I would I encourage you to go read the example in the textbook and try to do it. Let's just use the computer and it do this. <coughs> so, absolutely you can integrate analytically, you get a really messy expression of it. Let's just take a look, we haven't quite finished yet, we've got one more, um, one more component here in this first step, we haven't even finished that one. Right up the design equation for every species, let's take a look at that for CC. So for CC, it's DCC by DT is RC, which is equal to, let's put that up here again. <coughs> so rate of formation of, KC, of CC. Into 
CV, so you always see it the same way as we the fitting me. So K2 is CV. So I've done step one, and actually I've, I've done step two really at the same time. I've written out the design equation for every species, and I've written in the rate expression for every reaction. For both reaction A, or, sorry, for A going to B, as well as the reaction for B going to C. So I've kind of accomplished both <coughs> steps at the same time. What do we have here now on the board? These are the three equations that are telling me how species A, B, and C are changing in the batch over time. Three ODEs. What do we do with three ODEs? Can I read that? What do we need to integrate? We need initial conditions for every ODE. So I need CA. Well, first let me ask what's my independent and what's my dependent variable? Independent is time. Independent is time. T is my independent variable. My three dependent variables are CA, CV, and CC. Three independent variables. We also said in the previous class that when we've got three ODEs, DCA by DT, DCB, and DCC by DT, we need to express them all on the right hand side in terms of those three variables, those three concentrations. Okay, sorry about the mistakes tonight. So three dependent variables. For my three dependent variables, I have three initial conditions. Let's use that CA at time zero is two moles per liter. And I'll use that CV at time zero is equal to CC at time zero, which is zero. Anything else I need before I go hit polymath? What's my objective here? Find the time which maximizes B. Um, if you're using that logic, can you do uh, you identify the initial and final conditions for the independent variables? Or you, whether you use MATLAB or PolyMath or Python, you always have to do this. So the question is, do I need initial and final conditions for my independent variable? Yes, we do. So initial condition is T is 0. My final condition. I need to specify it. I must tell the software something, so something high. So, <coughs> so it's okay, so let's, let's take a look at this. I will post this code on the course website. Don't copy it down. Uh, just really pay attention to how we set this code up. Ready to go. Let's go ahead here on the top right hand side. <coughs> Let's turn this down so you can see it a bit more clearly. Okay, so hit this little icon over here. First differential equation is in terms of CA. So DCA by DT is equal to minus K1 times CA. Initial value for CA is 2. So there's my first ODE. I'm going to just uh, bunch my ODEs together. So there's DCA, DCB, and DCC by DT. The second ODE for these concentrations is K1CA minus K2 times CB. And the final ODE is K2. C. So we just check that minus K1CA 
minus K2CB plus K1CA, and then the third OGB is K2CB. Initial conditions for the three. CA0 is two moles per liter. And we specify the other two. Okay, Polymath is telling me up at the top over there I've got two undefined variables, so here where my mouse is, it's telling me you don't, you haven't specified K1 and K2 yet. Let's do those algebraic equations. K1 is equal to 0.5, 1 over hours, and K2 is 0.2. Next problem it identifies that the initial and or final values of the dependent variable are not set, so we can do that. So T at zero is zero, and T final is okay. So I'm only interested in the graph, I'm not so interested in the report yet. It's ready for solution, but so okay. So a hundred is clearly a, a big, a big overrest to it. Most of the interesting stuff happens up to twenty hours. After a hundred hours, it's, it's pretty much steady. So let's uh, go reduce that back to twenty and run it again. Time to get maximum concentration of B. Around three hours. Okay, so you can see that over here. So let's, uh, let's, uh, there's an interesting feature here. If you click that little table icon over there, you can get um, the information. So we can be a little bit more accurate and scroll down here and find when that B concentration through column B, CB, there peaks. So scroll down, let's put it a little too far. It peaked at around, yep, about here, 1.08. So let's just go a little bit beyond three hours, maybe about 3.2 hours, just to be sure we've reported this. So I'm just going to rerun that simulation this time with 3.2 <coughs> hours. Okay, so run that again. It looks like we've kind of just ported it. It's just starting to go down on, the, on that edge. So what I'm going to do is just make these lines really thick and uh, fix up the axes to look pretty. There we go. So if we go all the way down to the bottom here, we can see CB peaks at about one point, or at about three, three point, oh, about there, three point zero six hours. Okay, so that's the maximum time taken to achieve. Now, I do want to just continue, uh, use this example to introduce the concept of selectivity, overall selectivity. We're just going to use this data right out of the out of polymath. So I'm going to introduce a new selectivity. We're going to call this S with the tilde on it, SDU. We're going to call this overall selectivity. And it's equal to Exit flow or concentration of D of the desired over the exit flow or concentration of the undesired. And the reason why I'm using flow or concentration is that we would use flow if we were dealing with a plug flow reactor and we use concentration if we're dealing with the CST or uh, sorry, with the batch. So in this case overall selectivity for this example, what's my desired species is B, so I would write S of B over C. So this overall selectivity of my desired species D is B in this instance, my undesired species is 
component C is equal to the exit flow or concentration desired or the undesired. Well, from this table, I've determined now I'm going to stop my batch at around 3.05 hours. That's going to be the point where I get maximum B forming. If I keep going, B starts to drop off. So here's the CA, CB, and CC values at that particular instance in time. So I can stop my batch in that particular point in time and then use those concentrations. In here. So exit concentration of the desired species is CB, in this case over CC, which is 1.08, I'll say 1.09, over 0.48. So that's equal to about 2.28. What I'd like to show you quickly here in, in Polymath is one way that you can get Polymath to do all this calculation for you. So we know that this overall selectivity is CB divided by CC. Well, I can get Polymath to calculate that for me. So let me just add here an additional algebraic equation, and I'm going to call this overall selectivity. is equal to CB divided by CC. Okay, so Polymath accepts that it's still ready for solution. I can go ahead and solve that. I will go. Internal error trapped, 888. Zero denominator not allowed. Why is this happening? CC is zero at the initial condition. What can I do about it? Okay, we do the standard numerical trick and just add a little offset there to it. So plus one e to the minus 15. Okay, it's not gonna change things numerically. You just now go ahead and it, it's very happy. If I go to the table here, there's my overall selectivity calculator coming at every point in time through the batch. So I can go down to that particular row, which was at around 3.05, row 94, 95. There's the value of 2.28 calculated for me. So just a little bit of rounding error in my numbers, but it's essentially 2.2. So this is a great way to get Polymath to do the work for you, is to add these additional algebraic equations. No, it's actually integrating that for you already. Okay, there's no need to add this equation because it's already calculated C A here for me. Okay, so there's one other component, one other final quantity that is interesting here that I just want to quickly talk about or show you, and that's yield. So let's just let's just finish up by talking about yield. The batch reactor is the number of moles of the desired over Na naught time over Na. So yield is telling you how much of your desired species are you getting divided by the number of moles of raw material that you've reacted. Okay, so in this case, the desired species is B, so that's number of moles of B divided by number of moles of A over One thing I can do is I can divide the numerator and the denominator by the volume and I'll get concentration. So I can re-express that as CB over CA naught minus CA. And I'll just do that with your polygraph and then for the day. So I have one more algebraic term in here called yield, which is C B divided by C A naught, which is two minus C A. So if I run that, again I'm going to get this denominator error because for that rounding, let's add plus one e to minus the key. Run the guy. Table and 
notice here that yield, my yield starts off at zero and then changes and I can calculate my the yield that I get at that particular point in time. So at around 3.8 hours, I get a yield of 169. So I'll post this code to the website that you can play around with.